Hello, everybody. Welcome to the History Value Podcast. Today, I'm bringing together David Merce and Daniel T. Unterbrink, and today they are going to be debating on who is Jesus. It was previously going to be a live stream, but due to some issues that have came up, we had to um, go ahead and do a pre-recorded um, episode instead. Anyhow, I would like to pass the mic on first to Dan Unterbrink. So Daniel Unterbrink, I'm going to give you 10 minutes starting, well, as soon as I click on this uh, stopwatch. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay, begin. Present your case as to why you think Jesus is Judas the Galilean. Your introduction argument. 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, about 20 years ago, I, I had read the Bible many, many times, and then I'm you know, I was reading through Josephus, and I, and I noticed that the number of similarities that uh, Jews the Galilean had with Jesus, everything from um, cleansing the temple not once, but possibly twice. Um, the people in the movement were zealots. Uh, Judas was the founder of the zealot, zealot movement, and many of the disciples of Jesus, uh, Simon the Zealot, Sons, Sons of Thunder, Judas Iscariot or Sicarios, they had lots of similarities. And as you go through the, the pages of uh, antiquities and open up the New Testament, so especially the book of Acts, you can see things that, that uh, correspond uh, with the actual history of uh, um, uh, Judas the Galilean with the uh, gospel Jesus. Um, one thing that's important that I don't think too many people have done is to look at the timelines for both John the Baptist and uh, Paul. Uh, John the Baptist, the traditional timeline is right between 6 BCE and 30 to 33 CE. This is the time that he supposedly lived, and that would have been corresponding to the life of Jesus. But Josephus put the death of John the Baptist at 36 CE, which would have been after the death of Jesus. And he introduced a character named Sadik, or Righteous One, at 6 CE. And that was, he was the co-teacher with Judas the Galilean. Now the Slavic Josephus, who most people do not uh, accept because it, it's from the Middle Ages, but it, it, it presents information that you'd have to say is not presented anywhere else, that uh, it introduced John the Baptist in 6 CE to correspond with the introduction of Sadek, who was the co-teacher with Judas the Galilean. And then it also mentions the, the death of Judas or of John the Baptist in, 30, in 36 CE, and it also mentions him in 34 CE. So it's like, it's a totally different uh, time frame than what the gospels put. Forth. And it, it goes in line with the, God, or the uh, timeline of Judas the Galilean. Uh, and it's also interesting that his follow, John the Baptist followers, the, the Mandeans, believe that he preached for 42 years. He died in 36. That means he began his, his uh, career about 6 BCE, which is the time of Judas the Galilean and the, uh, when he and his... Uh, co-teacher at the time, Matthias, uh, uh, were at the temple cleansing. So, uh, you know, the, the John the Baptist character, from what we get from the historian Josephus, is much different th in the timeline than the uh, gospel uh, John the Baptist. So when we're looking for the, the real Jesus, if there was one, he has to most likely be in the same timeline as John the Baptist. Now, also, there's another character that we know a lot about, and that's uh, Paul. Mm -hmm. Now, most people assume that he was, uh, according to the book of Acts, that he becomes a member of the uh, movement after the death of Jesus, around 35, 36, and that he ends up being uh, with that movement for the next 30 or 40 years, and that he dies in Rome in the, in the 60s. 
Mm. But if you there's a passage in in Josephus that talks about King Isaides and he's being uh, uh, proselytized by by a, a Jew that is very much like Paul. And he says that there's a better way than having to be circumcised. Well, then there was a there was a teacher, Ananias or Eleazar, that sent from uh, Galilee to give him a different message that he had to be uh, circumcised. This happened in 44 CE. Now, it's interesting that Paul describes the exact same argument between himself and Cephas. And if, we, if it's similar to the, the time frame in Josephus, that would have been 44 CE. And Paul also talks about his uh, time in the movement as being at least 17 years. So even if we take the 44 CE moment and subtract out the 17, we're at 27 CE, which is long before the traditional Paul. So these are all, these timelines are supporting the, the timeline for an early, earlier uh, teacher, which would have been a Judas the Galilean and not the traditional Jesus character. Um, would you like to put on the, uh, the slides for some of the similarities? Okay, these similarities between Judas the Galilean and Jesus, I talked about the uh, both men cleansing the temple twice. Uh, the uh, Judas the Galilean did it in 4 BCE. Um, it was called the Golden Eagle Temple Cleansing, and it was uh, really a a cleansing that had to do with the the Roman corruption of the temple. Uh, then his uh, second, uh, we have to assume that there's there's no Josephus doesn't talk about Jews the Galileans' death, and you kind of wonder why because he talks about the death death of his two sons Simon and uh, and uh, James who. Uh, were crucified around 44 to 46 CE. Um, he also had another son that, that cleansed the temple that was uh, stoned. So it's like, it's, it's interesting that Josephus didn't mention the one person that he said was the most important person in the first century that, uh, uh, so it, it's just in incomprehensible that he wouldn't be mentioned. But there was a passage that talks about Jesus around 19 uh, uh, CE that I think was a replacement passage of the death mm. of Judas the Galilean. Okay, now both Judas was also, he had an opposition to Roman taxation. And there is a passage in 6, 6 CE where he was uh, uh, supposedly led a, a uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a tax oh, revolt in six, uh, 6 CE. And if you look at the Luke 23, Jesus supposedly was accused of refusing to pay taxes. So you've got, you've got this similarity here. And one other thing, I, I've got a list of like 40 or so of these comparisons in my book. Um, I, I've just listed a couple here. Um, there was a Barabbas event that occurred at the Golden Eagle Temple cleansing. And of course, everybody knows about the gospel story of uh, Jesus before Pilate and, and the Barabbas incident there. Both men were associated with zealots. Uh, Judas was the founder. Uh, Sadik was the co-founder. And both of them, you know, Sadik was John the Baptist. And I'm not the only one that thinks that. Uh, Robert Eisenman also uh, believes that uh, John the Baptist was static. Yep. So it's like, uh, I really do believe that uh, Judas the Galilean is the foundation but from all the other mythical teach teachings about this, this Jesus character. I'm not saying that, that uh, there was a historical Jesus. I'm just saying that it, the gospel Jesus was based primarily on this character named Judas the Galilean. 
and uh, I've got chapter and, and verse on all of this if you go through the book. And I think that's about my 10 minutes. So and nine minutes, 20 seconds, uh, really nine minutes and 19 seconds. But yeah. Um, OK, um, let me just load up David Mercer's presentation. OK. David Merce, opening statement. Ten minutes starts now. That was uh, very impressive, Dan. Very nice. Um, I see that you know you rely heavily on a lot of uh, similarities and, and uh, coincidental things. Mine is based more on little things that um, are in ancient writings that point to a later date, the more traditional date. Um, the fact that um, it's suggested that um, John the Baptist died in 36 is not a problem for my theory because I don't think that Jesus was crucified until 37. So John the Baptist was, you know, beheaded in 36 and not a problem to say that that happened before uh, Jesus was crucified in 37. Um, I think Jesus was from a wealthy family and there's proof kind of proof of that in the gospels um the fact that both he and his father joseph are known as tectones which has been translated for you know a few hundred years from the james uh, uh bible as uh, carpenters and now more liberally as builders or stonemasons um, the thing is, is that the word tectone was also used by Josephus to refer to the specially trained priests that were used to build the um, Jerusalem temple. So there's, you know, a real possibility that both Joseph and Jesus were priests and were uh, working on the temple rather than just ordinary carpenters. Um, it would have been unusual to have two carpenters trying to make a living in a very small town like Nazareth. And since carpenters were generally kind of one of the lower rungs of society back then, because they didn't own any land and they didn't raise any food for themselves, they could have gone anywhere. And there's, you know, scholars are now suggesting, well, maybe Jesus actually worked on Sephora's when it was being built. But you know, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because if you're not tied down to the land, you could just take your tools and go live in Sephora and uh, work there rather than having to travel back and forth. Um, the other thing too is that, and mostly I see little things that kind of indicate, you know, the truth or the historic, historical Jesus. One of those is in uh, the, the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. And when she first encounters Jesus, she says, why would you, a Judean, you know, ask me to get water for you? And that may be a mistake by the gospel writer, or it may be intended to pass along a little information that he's not a Galilean, he's a Judean. Um, I think Galilean was associated with him like... Oki was associated with people that migrated from the Dust Bowl to California. I think it was a slightly derogatory term, um, but it also kind of indicated that he was, you know, a poor, um, rural, kind of a hick from a hick area, uh, which is the image that he wanted to port portray. Um, getting back to Joseph and Jesus, when you look at the Gospels and you understand what they are, and I believe that they are strictly political propaganda, you start to understand that there's an underlying message within those. And since they were written during Roman occupation, they were couched in allegorical terms, metaphor. So you have to look a little bit deeper. So when he and his father are called tectones. That's one of those signs. 
And when you look at his birth narrative, that's another sign that you look underneath and you see the, the reality. For example, in the Gospels, or in the New Testament, I should say, the term um, shepherd is used around 20 times, and it always means a leader, and flock means the general population, and that's pointed out in Philo's history that he's very specific and said, you know, shepherd is for, le you know, local leaders and flocks are for the general population. So it's not just something that you kind of dig up out of the Gospels. The only time it isn't used to refer to leaders and general population are in, is in the uh, nativity scene where the terms are used in as real uh, comments about the people, that supposedly there are real shepherds that came to his birth and, you know, the, the shepherds were the leaders and the flock were the people. Um, if you take it statistically and say, you know, no, those are real local leaders and those are general populations that came to his birth, they're not just husbandmen, you know, taking care of sheep or goats or whatever. They're people, they're populations. Um, you start to understand that that goes along with the fact that maybe he's from a wealthy and prominent family, that this isn't just some fluke thing, that this was planned. And the fact that he's considered to be um, descended from David, the fact that he's and that would indicate that, you know, somebody somewhere, because they were a wealthy family, kept track of his, their genealogy, um, which you wouldn't expect from a poor carpenter, um, you know, tends to lead to the belief that, okay, maybe something else is going on here. The interesting thing is, is that that, is, that idea is backed up by archaeology. In 2011, archaeologists came out with the fact that they had found an ossuary that had the inscription, Miriam, daughter of Jesus, son of Caiaphas, priests of, and then it gives the, the rank of, you know, whatever section of the priesthood that they belong to and where they were from. That's all part of that same inscription. So to me, that kind of backs up the idea that being a tectone was a specially trained priest and that there's more to the gospel story than what you take at face value. Um, I think the idea on oh, the other thing is too, is that um, Josephus talks about um, Jesus ben Ananias. Well, if Jesus is the son of Caiaphas, then Caiaphas is listed in the Gospels as the son-in-law of Annas. Annas is the diminutive of Ananias. So the fact that Josephus wrote about this guy, Jesus ben Ananias, indicates that he was writing about the Gospel Jesus and his maternal grandfather. He didn't relate him to Caiaphas specifically. He related him to the higher priest, which was Annas in the Gospels. Um, there are other things, too, that are extra bi biblical that seem to point to the fact that there was writing about um, Jesus's parents. And it's an ancient work, kind of a midrashic redo of Joseph and Azeneth from the Old Testament. And if you look at that carefully, Azeneth as a name is a theophoric, which includes the uh, Egyptian goddess Neth or Neith, who was known in antiquity as the virgin mother goddess. That is associated with Mary. The fact that Azeneth also sweats blood when she's under duress ties her pretty directly to Jesus who sweats blood the night before his crucifixion. That actually turns out to be a genetic abnormality 
called Favism or G6PD. And it's a blood an anomaly that if you eat a fava, if you eat fava beans or if you have certain other problems or triggers, um, you go into hemolytic anemia, which is blood in your sweat. So him sweating blood, him producing watery blood when he is stabbed with the spear, those are direct signs. And I've spoken to a hematologist, very famous hematologist that confirmed that, that that's a sign of that genetic Your disorder. 10 minutes are up. Okay. Okay. Daniel Unterbrink, five minutes response, David Merce, and then uh, to David Merce, and then David Merce will respond to, to you in five minutes, and we'll proceed to cross-examination. Start. Okay, I just I just copied there, wrote down a couple things. Um, you talked about the death of Jesus in 37. Well, okay, if John died in 36, Jesus then died in 37. According to uh, one of the church fathers, uh, James was the head of the church for 24 years. Uh, he died in 62. That means he became the, the head of the church in 38. So that does line up 30 36 37 38 now but when you look at paul if the council to put james was in 38 that means that 17 years he talks about puts him in the movement in 21 so that's a that's a problem with the death of jesus in 37 uh it, that 21 year mark is very close to the uh the Josephus passage about Jesus. Okay, if you if you read through that, all the all the things that are going on are between eighteen and nineteen twenty or so uh, CE. So uh, I I just don't see how it's possible that Jesus would have died in thirty seven. Um, as for the birth narratives, uh, according to Matthew, uh, Jesus was born around four to six BCE. Uh, Luke has him uh, around six AD. And you look at the, the uh, major uh, parts of Judas's um, ministry, the golden eagle uh, temple cleansing was in four BCE, same time as the Matthew Jesus birth. His, his tax uprising against the Romans was in six AD. CE, which is the same time as uh, uh, Luke's uh, birth of Jesus. So what you have is the gospel writers incorporating the major things that, that Judas did, and they separated the, their, their Jesus from Judas, but they incorporated the major things in his life. Um, as for being from a wealthy family, I have no problem with that because According to Josephus, Judas the Galilean was, was famous across Judea for his knowledge and everything. So he probably was not a, a poor man like the, the Gospels talk about. Um, Jesus ben Ananias was kind of a crazy man in 70. He, but part of the Jesus, uh, uh, the Gospel story of Jesus in, in Matthew 23 and 24 is based on Jesus ben Ananias, you know, the woe to Jerusalem. And but, uh, this poor guy got hit in the head by a projectile and died. And it was interesting that one of the people that would have seen him in action was Paul, who I think was part of the uh, cabal that ended up writing some of the gospels. Okay, so you're gonna stop early at three I'll, minutes. I'll, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. Because, you know, I, some of the things I really haven't given a whole lot of thought to that, that David sure. presented. So it's kind of hard. I'm not going to, you know, and David, some of it very well could be, you know, right on the target. So, okay, David, five minutes counter response. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jesus' crucifixion in 37. In John, they indicate, uh, I think it's the Pharisees say to him, say to Jesus, you are not yet 50. So that puts him in his 40s, if we're to take it literally. 
Um, there's kind of really no other reason to put that comment in there except as a way of defining who and when they're talking. Um, so that would have made Jesus, if he was born 6 BCE, about 43 when he was crucified. Um, the other reason I think 37 is that since Vitellius, the governor of Sirius, uh, Syria, was in um, Jerusalem that year during Passover, um, the missing body, the empty tomb that Jesus disappeared from, would have been a real problem for Vitellius. And that's when both Pontius Pilate and Joseph Caiaphas were removed from power. And I believe that they were removed from power, despite what Jesus or Josephus says about Pilate and the Samaritan uprising, that causing his dismissal. I think the true story was that Vitellius felt that they had dropped the ball on this crucifixion of this political upstart. Um, so I think there's good. The other thing, too, is that there was an earthquake that was reported in during the crucifixion when Jesus passed, supposedly. And I've talked to a seismologist, and there actually was an earthquake with its epicenter in Ein Gedi, but he couldn't, the seismologist couldn't pin it down any more than roughly 26 CE and 36 CE. And when I pushed him a little bit on that, he said, I, and I said, could it have been 37? He said, yeah, it could have been, could have been 37. The interesting part about that is that there is that story in the gospels about the uh, holy ones who have been asleep rising up out of the ground. And one of the side effects of an earthquake can be what they call sand blows or sand volcanoes, which are a spray of dirt coming up out of the ground, almost like a, you know, a dry volcano type of thing. And people would have seen that and being uninitiated in geology, I'm sure they thought, well, maybe those are spirits coming out of the ground. And then that was embellished, that, that historical evidence was embellished to say, and they, you know, these are the, the saints, the holy ones that have risen up out of the ground, out of their graves, and they've walked around Jer Jerusalem. But I think it's, that story is based on an actual fact. And I think it's possible, very possible, that the earthquake took place in either 36 or 37. Um, God, there's so much to talk about. Uh, <laughs> the other thing I would say about, one of the things I noticed in your work was that, that on the very last couple of pages of your text, when you are talking about Josephus writing about um, the change in... Um, high priests coming in to Jerusalem and being affected um, when uh, Gratus came in as the procurator, um, was that you seem to feel that, you know, he was only there for three years, but the actual comment in Josephus is that he stayed in that Judea for 11 years. Well, if he came in in 15 and he stayed for 11, that puts him at 26, and he was take, you know, he was replaced by Pilate in, in 26. That goes along with traditional dating to me. I don't think just because it says after he had done these things, he was strictly talking about the succession of high priests. And when Caiaphas was appointed, there were no more changes to the high priesthood for many, many years. And so Gratus had done that in the first three or four years and gotten into Caiaphas. And then he stayed for 11 years total and left <clears throat> when he was replaced by Pilate. So I think, you know, that to me again, kind of puts the time frame into a more traditional view. Um, it matches up with, you know, when people are saying that Pilate took control. Um, Five minutes are up. Okay. Okay, let's enter in a cross-examination phase. Um, so open dialogue between the both of you. Um, 
let's start let's start off with daniel daniel underbrink uh responding with questions to what you're saying i'll take it from there uh, well i just wanted to uh bring up two points one when you talk about the not yet 50 from the book of john well, i could use the same passage and i and i really did when uh you look at Judas the Galilean's birth was probably around 26, 27 BCE. And then if you go to the 19 CE uh, death that's recorded by Josephus as the, the, the Jesus passage, um, yeah, that would have made him in his mid 40s, uh, Judas the Galilean at, at his death. So, you know, you, you say it could have been the Jesus as you look at it, but it could have been Judas the Galilean too. And as the high priest, there's a passage in John that talks about uh, the high priest that year. Um, if we're talking about uh, Caiaphas was there from 18 until 37, okay? The, the high priest that year, the year, three years before that, there was a high priest every year. It wasn't every three years, it was every year. Right. So the things that were going on, it was like the high priest that year. I mean, if it would have been 15 years into Caiaphas, a reign or 10 years into it would he have said the high priest that year i don't think so so and, and Pilate also um and i've got a chapter in the book about um possibility that he could have been brought in at 18 because if you look at uh josephus he puts all he puts things in chronological order and he has all these 18 uh CE events, and then he introduces Pilate. According to tradition, it's 26. Like I agree with you, that's what it says. But then after that, there's like three or four items that again it's going, he's going back to 18, 19 uh, right. CE, like he's talking about Germanicus, but he died in 19. And then he introduces Pilate again. And so we go, okay, now, now he's jumping to 26 again. And then after that, he's going back to 19. So it's like it makes sense to me. And uh, Joseph, or, uh, Robert Eisenman also thinks this, that uh, there's a good chance that Pilate could have been brought in and Caiaphas was his man from 18 all the way to 37. They came in together, they left together. And there's also coin data that I have in, a, in an, another book that I, I think I can do a good job of showing that that could have been the coins, some of the coins with Pilate could have been as, as early as 18. So um, that gets into you know, a lot more uh, detail and everything. But I think, I think there's, a, there's a chance he could have been there at 18. But you know, it's, a we, we, it's one of those deals where you had the, uh, Josephus having a passage about, supposedly I, I think Judas the Galilean but yet it was most almost all scholars think that the the uh, testimonium is is not wasn't done uh, by Josephus that was done later right put Jesus character in there right okay so if that could have been changed the date of of uh, Pilate could have been changed also you know, gratis could have been there three years instead of 10 years or whatever. So it's like, I think I can make a good case that he was there before 26. The thing about the testimonium is that I think it's all an, an interpolation. And if you look at where it is, has been placed, it is right before the chapter of the Samaritan uprising. And I am a firm believer that Jesus was responsible for leading that Samaritan uprising. And there's two points that stand out to me. One, the gospel story of, again, of the Samaritan woman indicates politically that he was trying to incorporate the Samaritans into the general revolt that he wanted against the Romans. Um, and two, I think Jesus was one of the few leaders that actually escaped, which Joseph, Josephus kind of mentions um, that some, some of the Samaritans got away. Well, 
when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, and that would have taken place late in 36, okay, that the Samaritan uprising was late in 36. When Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, he arrives to people waving branches around. Mark has them laying branches down in the street, which is a sign of respect. But the other gospels kind of indicate that they were waving palm branches and stuff. That's generally a specific sign of the Feast of the Tabernacles, which takes place late in the year, in the autumn, late autumn. <coughs> so that would indicate to me that far from arriving in the spring, that Jesus actually arrived late in 36 and the Feast of the Tabernacles was going on which was why everybody was waving the palm branches. Um, that again places him in, you know, late in the thirties into Jerusalem, not earlier. I mean, maybe you can make that connection earlier because the, the Feast of the Tabernacles was an annual event that, you know, had taken place for, you know, many hundreds of years, maybe, but I, I'm hard pressed to see that. So to me, it makes more sense that, he came in, in in late 36 into the city, and as the Gospels portray it, he was there for maybe a week, and these people that were, you know, Hosanna and hallelujah, and Jesus is here, within a week turned to hating him and wanting him killed. That doesn't make any sense to me, but if he came months before, if he actually came months before, and the Gospels compressed the time frame, then there's some explanation for why they greeted him as maybe a rebellious leader with the Samaritans. And then later on, months later, <clears throat> in the spring of 37, they said, you know what, we don't need this kind of upheaval. We don't need a revolt. We want the status quo. And then they started to turn against him. And that just seems more reasonable to me than you know, that he showed up in spring and a week later, they're, you know, wanting to cut his throat. The fact of the matter is, is that if he is the son of Caiaphas and he and Caiaphas and maybe even Annas have cooked up the thing to fake his resurrection, the Jews could kill Jesus any way they wanted to. John was beheaded. Um, they could have stoned him. They could have drowned him. But Caiaphas pushed for a crucifixion, probably the only form of capital punishment that had any chance of survival. So the point was that this family was trying very hard to instigate a revolt against the Romans, and they had cooked up this plan to show that Jesus was miraculous and close to God by having him resurrected. And therefore, Caiaphas, who was a part of the plan, pushed for crucifixion. Now, part of the story of that is that Tiberius, for a long time, uh, and especially after Sejanus was removed from power, pushed the empire officials to respect local customs. So when the Jews are saying to Pilate, you'll be no friend of Caesar's, that's what they're speaking about. Do what we want you to do. Otherwise, you're not going to be respecting our feelings and customs. So far from getting a Roman flogging, Jesus got the 39 stripes that were prescribed in Jewish law. That's what that passage is about. They're telling Pilate, you only have kind of one choice here, and that is to crucify him. You can't beat him half to death. You can only give him 39. Um, that's one of those little things that are, you know, you pick up and you look at and you go, okay, this means something else is happening. And that's my take on it. And again, that would push it to be a later thing because we don't have that information about Judas the Galilean. Um, and the, the, to go back to the Jesus Ben Ananias thing, if you read that carefully, Jesus 
comes into Jerusalem in 62 CE, this Jesus ben Ananias, the same year that James is killed or assassinated. And for the first four years, Jesus ben Ananias hides his identity. This is what Josephus says. And Josephus calls him kind of a, a country hick, a, you know, kind of a bore, you know, a nobody from nowhere, not very smart. But Jesus ben Ananias exposes who he is in 66 CE when the revolt starts, because at that point, he doesn't have to hide his identity anymore because the war has started. It, it doesn't, it mattered for the first four years from 62 to 66 that he wouldn't be exposed to the Romans as an escaped or, uh, yeah, an escaped capital punishment crucified victim. He had to hide his identity for those four years, but once the revolt started, it didn't matter. So there are things that tie into the gospel Jesus in that account very clearly. And you said it earlier, Jesus ben Ananias spoke exactly like the gospel Jesus did. Woe to Jerusalem, you know, all that stuff. Um, he was speaking the same language as the gospel Jesus. And when he is described by, Kaif, or by Josephus and stuff, you kind of have to draw the parallel. And Josephus says he's Jesus ben Ananias, Jesus ben Annas. He is the maternal grandson of the high priest. The other thing is, too, when you say something about, you know, in one of the uh, one of your comments about Caiaphas was referred to as the high priest that year. People don't realize there were two Sanhedrins. The Old Testament talks about provincial Sanhedrins, which by the first century had coalesced into a single Sanhedrin. And then there was the great Sanhedrin, which Annas was the high priest to. So the lower Sanhedrin handled civil matters, civil crimes. The great Sanhedrin handled theological religious things. So, and that was like our Supreme Court. It was like a lifetime position for that high priest. That's why Annas was, you know, seems to have been the high priest for a very long period of time, or that, you know, people went to him for advice about things and why Jesus was taken to him, because they were still trying to determine what we could charge this guy with. And <clears throat> he was turned back over to Caiaphas, who was the high priest of the lower Sanhedrin, the civil Sanhedrin, and he was dealt with, you know, through that, his father. So all of that, you know, to me, supports the idea that it's a later situation. It's not Judas the Galilean, it's Jesus, son of um, Caiaphas. Any rebuttal to that? Uh, well, first of all, going back to the, uh, the testimonium, right after that, uh, uh, Josephus talks about a Paulina is swindled out of money by an unnamed Jew. That was in 19 uh, CE. And that's corroborated by Tacitus. So you've got, you still on either side of that passage, you've got 19 uh, CE events. Now you might, you're talking about a later event, but it wasn't, uh, the uh, testimonium is sandwiched between 19 CE events. Okay. As for, as for uh, John the Baptist, when he, he gets killed by, uh, beheaded by Herod Antipas, uh, and the reason why is that Josephus said that the people were willing to do anything for him. Uh, and, you know, the government was afraid because this guy, this guy could control the masses. Same thing with Judas the Galilean. He leads the tax revolt in 6 uh, CE. He would have been the most popular person in Judea, you know. And so when he comes in, uh, to, to Jerusalem around 1819 CE, he would have been treated like a king, you know, and it was him against the uh, Annas and Caiaphas and Pilate. It was, it was, uh, he was an anti-establishment character. Uh, he was anti-Roman, anti-Herodian, uh, 
anti the the priesthood that was that was there he wasn't i don't think by any means that he was related to the priesthood i think the priesthood at that time was uh wanted him gone you know he would he would and they even accused him in in the book of luke of of uh teaching against paying taxes to rome well you know that was the the zealot of, of uh the beginning of the zealot movement really mm-hmm. uh, judas the galilean so I, I just think the time frame, I see what you're saying, and, but uh, it, it, this Jesus, Ben Ananias, you know, I think he was a colorful character that a later gospel writer said, oh, we can get a good chapter out of that. And they incorporated into the life of uh, this Jesus, but, you know, Jesus wasn't around in, in 65 to 70 CE. I mean, they're putting that back onto him. And, you know that's that would have no truth to it you know he was he was anti anti herodian anti roman anti high priest you know all the way who was so I, jesus was or the judas the galilean who i think is the historical jesus but the basis behind what the the Jesus so of Nazareth character is a, is a kind of a combination of characters. You know, he's part Paul, he's part Judas the Galilean, he's part Ben, you know, Ananias. I mean, he's, he's a, he cobbled together. It's not, it's not a real one person character. So I, I, you know, I, well, I had to disagree with you on that. I think he's a, a real uh, singular person. If you I, have, well, yeah, he is. But if, if you have, have an ossuary that says that, you know, you've got Miriam, daughter of Jesus, son of Caiaphas, to me, that means, okay, that's a real historical person. That's not just you don't a, know it was a, a myth. Well, if you look at the other stuff, you can draw that conclusion. The other side is, is that if you read um, Joseph and Azaneth, you recognize that those are his parents, that the Joseph is Joseph Caiaphas. And the reason you make that connection is that because in the Azaneth story, she is talking about, her father is talking about introducing her to Joseph, this very famous man. And she makes the question, is this the Joseph whose father abandoned him? Well, the Old Testament Joseph wasn't abandoned by his father. He was abandoned by his brothers. His father loved him dearly. Well, what does that say? What, what does that little thing tell you that she made a mistake or she got the story wrong? Joseph Caiaphas was not Joseph Ben Caiaphas. He was not associated with a father. Joseph or Josephus writes about him and says, you know, Joseph called Caiaphas, and in the segment that we were talking about with the change in the priests when Gratus came in, all the priests that were mentioned that stayed for a year, they were all the son of somebody. It was, you know, so-and-so, Ben, so-and-so. Not Joseph Caiaphas in that passage. It's just Joseph Caiaphas. So in the Azanath story, the rewrite of that story, they are trying to say that this is Caiaphas we're talking about. He wasn't abandoned by his father in the Old Testament, but we're going to put it down that he's been abandoned by his father in this story to connect him to the real Caiaphas. That's the only reason that somebody that's knowledgeable in the Old Testament would have made that change. Uh, Again, she sweats blood. Um, the, the genetic disorder is generally passed down from mother to son. So she sweats blood when she's under duress. That's in the Azaneth story. She's called the virgin, uh, mother goddess, which is kind of how his mother was considered. These are real people that they're talking about, but because they're under Roman occupation, they cannot just come out and give their name, address, and serial number to the Romans. They have to hide their intent. And only people that are really knowledgeable are going to be able to understand that. And that's what Jesus says throughout the, the, the Gospels is that 
you know, most of the people aren't going to understand what we're talking about, but there are some that will. The other thing is, is that when Jesus as a young boy is left behind by his family, they find him on the temple. And what does he say? Where else would I be but at the house of my father? He's not talking about God, which would have been blasphemy. He's talking about his father, Caiaphas. That's where Caiaphas worked. And as a, you know, a young boy, if you're left behind, if you're abandoned by your father and you know where your father works, that's where you go because the people that work there too know who you are and they know your father. So there are lots of little things that point to the fact that Caiaphas was his father and that would make Annas or Ananias his maternal grandfather. And there's more in that story too. I mean, the story, if you look at it carefully, gives a complete, pretty accurate description of the Jerusalem temple from the Pilgrim's Road to fountains to the tower, which is where Mary Magdalene gets her name, Migdal. It's not from a fish drying tower around the Sea of Galilee. It's because she was a prominent person in society and she lived in the fortress Antonia which had a tower. That's where the high priests used to live and keep their vestments. Then it was turned over to the Roman army at some point. But originally, the, priest, the high priests lived there. Well, Mary lived in this tower on the seventh, there were seven floors or whatever. Um, so that's how she got her name. So Mary Magdalene is his mother. It's not his wife. It's not some you know, lover or something like that. Um, and some of the scholars are so very dishonest about this stuff. They say, you know, the actual document that has this in whatever, what is it, the Gospel of Peter or something like that, where it says, and Joseph used to kiss her often on the, there's a wormhole at that point. There's no indication where he used to kiss her. But scholars have plugged in mouth, which kind of gives a more romantic image. Could have been a forehead could have been you know on her cheek whatever but a lot of scholars plug in mouth which isn't there in the original document so i don't see any problem with the fact that mary magdalene was her his mother i just i think that blends in very well and i think you have to look at it through the eyes of this is written under roman occupation it's political in nature and we can't just you know you look at like the french uh, underground during the Second World War, during you know the Nazi occupation, those people weren't going to put out their name and address. They were they were going to hide. They were going to keep things secret. They had radios so they could communicate. The people in Jesus's time had things like the Gospels where they tried to communicate what they were doing. I don't know. Makes sense to me, but <laughs> but I'm sure you're I, I just, to you. <laughs> I just have problems with the idea of. You know, Annas had a son-in-law, Caiaphas, four sons that were high priests, and all the way through, they persecuted. The, uh, uh, James was put to death when uh, one of uh, uh, Annas' or Caiaphas, what was it, Annas' sons was high priest. You have the, uh, the sons of Judas the Galilean were put to death or crucified when an, another of his sons was high priest. Jesus was crucified when Caiaphas was high priest and then Annas also was you know, involved. So it's like these guys were t totally against uh, the movement that was led by uh, the Jesus character, John the Baptist and James. I mean, they, they were all put to death. And it was all with the uh, the uh, blessing of uh, the high priest. So I, to, to to me, for them to be related is just absurd. I, I can't I can't accept that. I, I don't I don't see any way that it could be possible. Do you have any siblings? No, yeah, that's, okay. that's, that's, siblings. And there are things I would never tell them. That's not beyond the realm but of it, it's, ability. It, not it's at just, all. You got to understand why why did why did people, why do the gospels say that Jesus's family thought he was crazy? Well, that's a, that's a good one. 
You know who, why, why were they you know who that was probably about? It was probably about Paul. Okay, think about it. Paul's a Herodian. He goes in with the Jesus movement. Who would his family would have thought he was crazy? A Herodian with the Jesus movement? Okay. But it's much more now, like now with, with Jesus all the way through, he's looked at uh at least historically, like Judas the Galilean, he's a hero to everybody. His family would, he would have been a hero, you know? So that, that passage had nothing to do with the history. No, not at all, not at all. You've got his family that are wealthy, that are part of the priesthood, that enjoy a very good lifestyle and your sibling or son, well, not your son, because his parents would have been involved in the, in the uh, plot too, but they all live a pretty decent life. And so when they say that, they're looking at somebody in their family who is proposing to bring that lifestyle to an end through revolution. Yeah, he, he preached. They were uh, not. Like a pure communism. They were not happy about that no. at all. They would not have been happy about that. Now, did they maybe come around to it? Maybe James came around to it and understood what he and uh, Caiaphas were trying to accomplish? Yeah. Probably. Did Annas know what these guys were up to? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. It would have been easy to do on the side, keep it secret, keep it out of the eyes of Annas. He may have known, but we have no way of knowing that. But certainly for them to make a comment in the Gospels about his family having a problem with Jesus, I don't think you can lay that on Paul. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that the Gospels were written well before Paul and obviously Josephus. I think instead of looking at the Gospels as being dependent on Josephus, I think Josephus used things from the Gospels. I think he took things that actually happened and, and rewrote them um, to show certain things to the Romans that he might not have had any other way. And I believe that the, the Gospels were written in the mid to late 30s. Uh, so yeah, when, think, when things I were happening with you there, but no, because I think it, they at least, well, here's the thing. The first two are Mark and Luke. That's the order. And there is internal evidence to support that. There are progressions in the gospels that say Mark first and then Luke and then Matthew. Um, they were written Jewish writings in Greek with Roman names, okay? Roman titles. Mark and Luke are both Roman names. That is specifically a fingerprint of how Philo wrote. He's, there's been a study on all of his works and he's the only ancient writer, and this is according to Stanford's School of Philosophy, he's the only ancient writer that wrote that way, that he wrote Jewish works in Greek with Roman titles. And I think that pins at least Mark and Luke, possibly Matthew, to, to Philo. Now, of course, I'm going to get a lot of you know, pushback on that. But when you look at some of the other things, you begin to realize that that's very possible, that you know, Philo was a priest. He made at least one journey to the Jerusalem temple contemporaneously to Joseph and Jesus. So he could have easily known about them. Um, he was not a fan of the Romans. He would have preferred that they went away. And he could have easily written these things. Um, there are things, there are stories in underneath layers in the Gospels that indicate historical events that take place in the 20s and the 30s that can be tied to them. Um, one of them is the Gadarene demoniac, which is really about um, Antipas forcibly populating Tiberius once he had built the city. The city had been built on an ancient graveyard. Um, Josephus mentions it right after the passage that we were talking about with the change in the, in the priests when Gratus came in. One of the next segments that Josephus wrote, writes about is the fact that Tiberius was built on this ancient graveyard, and according to their laws, if you went there, you were unclean for seven days. 
So if you lived there, you were constantly ritually unclean. Well, that's what the gathering demoniac is. It's a guy that's chained to a cemetery and who is held there by this demon that's in him, who is called legion, referring to the Roman legion that forced people to stay in Tiberias. And that's pretty much what Josephus says. People were forced to, Jews especially, were forced to live there. So you can connect some of this stuff. That probably would have happened in, well, if Jesus was born in 6 BCE, and he was about 30 when he started his, his works, that would have been about 24 CE. And that's why that's in there is because that started his ministry. That's one of the things that kicked off his ministry and his political moves. Now, there are other things like the Samaritan woman and, you know, several other things that are like that, that tie into historical events. Now, you know, if you got anything on Judas that said he had a genetic problem or that his parents were written about or whatever, you know, that that might sway me a little bit, but the things that I'm coming across seem to indicate he started his ministry in 24, and it wasn't just a three-year ministry. That's another scholarly misconception. I they, agree with there. Yeah, they just base that on the number of times it's mentioned in the Gospels. I think his ministry was like 11 or 12 years. You know, it took some time for him to get, get notoriety and to get people on his side. Anyway. Yeah. Well, I, I would say the Judas of Galilean theory, he would have been around for like 25 years. John the Baptist could have been around for as much as 42 years. So it's like consistent. Uh, it, it's not the, the one to three year type of deal that right. you can't build a movement back no. then in that short of time. It was a, it was a lengthy process. So it would have had to have been. at least agree. I agree on that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, I'm trying to think of this. Uh, again, there's little biographical detail in the Gospels because they're hiding Jesus's identity. Now, the mythicists kind of go along the lines of, and, and in a sense, you're doing this too. You're, you're taking the historical Jesus and reconfiguring him as Judas. But there are reasons why there weren't things that we have today written about Jesus. Roman occupation was one of them. Damnatio memoriae would have been, you know, proclaimed against Jesus if he survived the crucifixion. The Romans couldn't have this survival of crucifixion running around and still talking to his followers. And they, lit, they, they kept control of populations through fear. But if people got the idea that you could survive crucifixion somehow, that would have been a problem for the Romans. So they damned Jesus's memory and they didn't write about him. <clears throat> it would have been the death penalty for you if you mentioned his name or you started talking about him. Um, so I think that contributes to it. The fact that the whole culture was wiped out in 70, anything that had might have been written about him would have been wiped out. And there was the Jewish uh, prohibition about slander, that slander was a, a sin. So if you didn't have exact information about Jesus, if you were just trying to badmouth them, that was a problem for you within your religion. That was a sin. So there would have been people that would have said, you know, hey, we'd heard about this guy. He supposedly survived crucifixion. No, that would have been something you didn't talk about. But I think the big thing is people wouldn't have written anything because of the Roman occupation. They wouldn't have taken the chance on writing something down that had political and revolutionary implications because if the Romans got a hold of it, they would have grabbed that person up and they would have killed them. So I think there are a lot of reasons why there's, there was nothing written around. In fact, it's, it's very surprising that the gospel survived. Um, I'm, I'm amazed that that even happened, I, that they should have been wiped out too. So 
we have what we have as far as the gospels and as far as and again that's the argument for why things were written um in allegory metaphor parables um, that connected to historical events because those were real things but they couldn't come out and say they were real things I don't have nothing. I have nothing else to add, Jacob. Okay. It's up to you. Well, in that case, I think we could stop there. It looks like we've gone through all the material actually much faster than I thought we would have. <laughs> I thought it would, I actually thought it was going to take longer. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate uh, both of you for coming on. This has been a, um, a fascinating discussion. Uh, I thought the debate. I thought the debate went quite well. Because so I've had I've had debates I've, in the past that were very heated, um, like the one I did with Dr. Carrier and James Valiant. There's another one I did in between, but I haven't edited it and released it yet. Um, but I'm going to uh, do that soon. Soon enough. But anyway, thank you both for joining me. One uh, for joining for joining me. I'm Daniel Underbrink. Uh, I'm glad you that you rejoined History Valley. I think uh, I think we should do probably do some shows down the line. It's been a while. You know, catch up and look at other stuff that I haven't looked at before. Okay. Yep. Sounds good. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks I have your book, by the way. I've read your book a couple of times. I bought it when it first came out, and I just <laughs> recently pulled it out again and kind of skimmed through it again. And honestly, if I didn't believe in some of the things that I'd come across, I think your theory has a lot of merit to it. And I can see yeah, why. You I'm not sure if anybody has all the answers to, to everything, you know? Yeah. There's, I, I hear things and I go, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And then, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> when you get right down to, to it. it <laughs> I hate to say it. It's a question of belief. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. It's what sounds good to you. Yeah. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.